the Kutch Gallery uh, in Queen Street Gallery in Neath. Uh, we're having a wander around the Atlas de Zoology section of uh, my uh, large solo show that's currently on show there. Um, I'm currently in uh, Brisbane, Australia. Scott is in Neath, South Wales, UK. Scott's there and uh, yeah, we're just going to be chatting through some of the bits and bobs about this exhibition and how it came to be. So yeah, anything you wanted to say, Scott? Well, thank you for joining us, especially all the way from Australia. And well, the thing I was going to ask really is your first inspiration behind uh, the zoology project, because it kind of encompasses wildlife from both Australia and Wales and other parts of the world. But yeah, your first kind of inspiration for this project for me. Well, it's it's actually it's Bethan's fault, really. The Mr. Tom artwork that you see there is I, I agreed to do an artwork for her Corgis and Coronets exhibition in when was it early 2022, I, I think. Um and I didn't really do animal portraiture at that stage, but I wanted to challenge myself with uh, an animal themed work because the theme was man's best friend. So I did an artwork that was, well, woman's best friend that was uh, Mr. Tom. But Mr. Tom was my uh, now fiance's late service dog who uh, died in 2021. And it was a bit of a tribute to him. And that's kind of spawned both the wild animal series and the sort of pet portraits services that we do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an appropriate place to kind of have the exhibition together as it started really at Studio 40 to have the kind of current stage of the show there. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's uh, sort of coming home, I guess, <laughs> to the origin. So, yeah, uh, yeah, th there's a variety of sources of images here as well. Um, sometimes we brought the rights to a picture to use it as source information. Sometimes people have donated them. Sometimes uh, they're open source images or archival uh, illustrations. Part of the idea is kind of based around this idea of biological illustrations that were quite common in like the 19th, 18th century, where before the age of cameras, um to illustrate exotic animals really we we're right up until the sort of 80s and 90s we were sort of you would still see the little rspb books of birds with lots of beautiful illustrations in them uh so the very recent menu recent uh history really sort of losing this kind of biological illustration type thing so i've tried where possible to be accurate to the real life animal. Um, in some cases, I've just gone off the wall a bit and put some Easter eggs in there for people. You thought about um, getting them in in a book for Mark, like yeah. um, like a play on a traditional sort of you know Victorian zoology book. Um. I I mean you'll hopefully you'll see there's some sort of catalog somewhere in that room of the artworks. I think that's as far as we got with turning them into the book. Uh, but thanks to Jasmine, yeah. my partner, uh, both in business and life, um, we were able to get a lot of literature written up. Um, at this stage, there's no plans to publish anything formally. Uh, mm -hmm more of a sort of catalogue for people to browse than anything. Yeah. And is this going to be uh, a continuing project? Um, I hope so. I, I have a solo show next year in Scotland and I haven't negotiated the nature of the show, but it's my hope that this will form a foundation of part of at least part of the show. Uh, we can blend in some more Scottish animals uh, as well, perhaps take out some of the older works and vary it a bit. Um, yeah. 
there's any galleries out there watching the final version of this video, then we are looking for other venues, especially in England, North Wales, parts of uh, other parts of South Wales to tour the uh, exhibition to. Um, and yeah, it's it's hopefully be an ever growing series and looking to expand really beyond those kind of those centres that we've got at the moment. I should note uh, Koala, the koala that's on the other side there, has just won an award at the Royal Society of Arts in Queensland, won a Young Artist Excellence Award. Oh, well done. Uh, and, yeah, a lot of it's just find, finding different things. I mean, different works were added to the series for different reasons, tried to vary the different types of artworks in it. I do yeah. like more flowers. It's a bit weak on the flowers at the moment. Yeah, the flowers are lovely. Um, um, I particularly like this one. That was a bit of an experimental work because you see the lilies not got as much detail in it as the rose. I tried to sort of focus the detailed areas around the flower itself rather than getting yeah. into the surrounding areas. Um, you can also see the first time I tried out using... The transparent shapes in the shadow of the lily, which I perfected in the bee, which should be just above it. Um, so the wing there is sort of got lots of transparent shapes in it. Yeah. Uh, what um, program do you use? So I. So uh, I actually use Microsoft Office PowerPoint, um, which tends to be met by extreme responses either people try to persuade me to use the more sophisticated uh programs or people are just really impressed that you can create such detailed artworks in a quite basic program um i kind of like the basicness of the office suite because the the adobe suites and so on um have basically too many bells and whistles and it's quite difficult to do the basic just creation of shapes that i need to do this type of work i think some some modern programs have so much options on them that it's a bit overwhelming yeah so it's uh i've kind of i've found my own strange niche in a kind of non-existent uh, i've kind of ended up being a traditional digital artist who kind of works in a digital way, but that is kind of stubborn about using the most basic software that you can get because I find it's most effective for this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is very effective. We work it very well. The only downside I have is I can only blow them up so big, but I think I can probably get them to at least A0 before they start getting fuzzy. No, I mean, they all print very well with this size and, you know, they're, a bit, they're quite a large size here. This, yeah, in terms of sort of pet portraits and artworks of animals, wild animals, is the size that tends to be the best seller, aside from obviously the small mounted prints that you also have there, the sort of uh, 15, uh, 20 pound type pieces. Fun bit of trivia, that parrot has just gone, well, not that particular example one of the joys of digitally created works is that they're often simultaneously in exhibition in different parts of the world and the parrot is just on its way to sao paulo in brazil for an exhibition oh, wow. there. um oh. yeah so I, I i don't tend to call them prints so much because uh that's just as an original artwork somewhere um, yeah they're, they're very much digitally born artworks. Um, I don't tend to say I do limited edition, they're open edition. But because we're quite a small kind of shoestring operation, there's not, there's not likely to be hundreds of works. And over time, we sort of rotate out works. There's a few of the older works we've been discussing phasing out as newer works get created. Yeah. Um, it's just difficult sometimes to decide which one of the old favourites go. Yeah, I can imagine it would be tricky navigating that. So we have a look out on the wall. Yeah, so 
Uh, the Queen Street exhibition, uh, we're quite privileged to have quite a large exhibition space, and we've got a lot of back catalogue works on show as well as the zoology show. Not sure if Scott wants to pick out some work to talk about. I'll pick out a few, and you can always edit out then. Well, I'll just show everything, actually. It's really nicely displayed on the wall. As you can see, it goes right down to the back with Paddington at the back. <laughs> But this one is interesting because it's a traditional painting. Um, yeah, so this, it's not the biggest traditional painting I've done in this style. It's the biggest I've done by myself without the participation of volunteers. Um, the only work bigger I did than this was 12 foot by 8 foot and is on the front of Borth Community Centre in Mid Wales. And that was partially painted through the volunteer time of the Borth Community Hub. This one's interesting because with the outline, and the the um the black lines, it kind of almost has a stained glass effect to it. Yeah. So this is has been our whole sort of thing with outlines. You'll notice on the um the the company logo, which I did do that kind of effect. So yeah. what you have is you have Owen Glyndor and you have uh, Lord Percy uh, ha Henry Hotspur, if I remember my medieval figures correctly. Um, it's actually quite nice how they've been positioned because whilst at points they were enemies, uh, at the end of their lives they were actually allies fighting alongside each other against the English crown at the time. Um, so it's kind of it's more of a sort of embracing that allied side and there's there's nice little easter egg here with i.e base the uh oang lindur equestrian portrait of quite a famous early 20th century painting the, the name of the artist escapes me but the composition is based off a sort of out of copyright oil painting um mm. But the oil painting scans I could find were so low quality, I couldn't pick out the facial features. So the faces you have there, uh, I'm actually Owen Glendur, and the little pikeman next to me is uh, my one of my closest friends, Connor Brockback, who <laughs> is a lovely Anglo-Irish historian, if anyone is interested in the nature of the Irish diaspora. So th this is more Borderlands stuff. So this is uh, the judge's lodging in Prestine. This work was originally created for the uh, solo show we had up at Hay on Wai in January. But yeah, very interesting building if anyone wants to research that. Uh, above it, you've got uh, a, um, a Marion, Marion icon. So uh, a religious icon. It's called the Eliosa icon. Um, it's it's quite common in Eastern Orthodox Christianity. It's also referred to sometimes as the Virgin of Tenderness in um, Western Christianity. And it's where the child Jesus is resting its face against the Madonna. Um, it's quite a tender child uh, image that's often repeated throughout uh, iconography. Um, this work was kind of created more as a passion project. Um, the the icon itself, um, it's it's not really been one for sales, but I've always wanted to have a go at iconography, um, mm. and I struggled with doing it in the traditional way when I had a go. So I thought, why not try and do it the way I create my own paintings? So I based this from um, a Romanian Orthodox icon. Um, it really follows in the tradition of icon painters that each icon was based off a previous icon. So they're versions of versions of versions. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. The frame itself is actually Edwardian, 1904. The frame was in very, very poor shape. So a big restoration effort. Um, and it's come out really, really well. Um, basically, we repolished, sanded, uh, the gold inlet's been repainted. Sadly, I couldn't afford the gold leaf, but it's done in a very metallic gold acrylic. Um, mm. Yeah, it looks it looks great framed like that, and the gold as well. So this one's called Tear Ara Brin, Tear Ara Munad, 
the house on the hill, the house on the mountain. But it's a bit of a tribute to a project I did way back in 20, 2018 with the Royal Commission for Nature and Historical Monuments of Wales. Uh, but we're looking into an upland hill farm. This is not based off that exact site. It's actually based off a kind of fancied version of a Welsh hill farm. But there's elements of that that have been brought in. Um, and then elements of vintage and press photographs. The fun trivia is um, that canvas actually was originally brought for my degree show. Uh, and underneath it, there is a abstract painting based off the history seminar room at the old college uh uh hen Golig in uh Aberystwyth. um so that it's kind of got multiple layers of history in it both of my yeah. own and uh of its own yeah oh that's interesting yeah i it's quite a popular thing artists do now is uh painting over older work yeah uh, some friends of mine in the arts world find it quite brutal um i i find if i get too sentimental i keep everything so i just have to try try to look at things from a business perspective those were high quality canvases it wasn't a painting i was ever going to sell and i needed a canvas so uh, i yeah. i think it's the same for a lot of artists going back through the centuries people would reuse what canvases they had lying around when money was tight um going for my first solo show and i didn't have the money for the canvases <laughs> um that that one's uh actually the lower one here it's it's had various names over the years i can't remember what we've called it for this exhibition uh but it's it's actually lonely cottage it's it's based off a vintage watercolor that i found in a junk shop uh in abba i believe oh. it's in derbyshire yeah that's what uh, we've got it like that's all i know about it the framer's address on the back of it was in derbyshire so i've suggested it basically it's a english sort of hillside scene of some kind um it's got a nice touch to it because the it does have a little sort of concrete bridge in the foreground, so it's it's not kind of plays on the quaint English scene, uh, and that's mm. it's the same in the original as well. That's something I've brought through from the original watercolor, sort of nineteen yeah. seventies watercolor. We've got quite a few. It's interesting that have sort of you know traditional kind of themes, but you've given them a sort of modern and graphic updates, which is really interesting. Uh, yeah, well, that's what we try and do. I've not done many landscapes recently, so it's actually it's nice to see the landscapes uh, out for a bit of a sort of tour from the storage. Now, this this work, I think uh, my myself and Scott have already talked about kind of off camera uh, some way. Um, Scott, I don't know if you want to lead on questions about this work because you found it quite interesting. Yeah, it's just the the, the kind of pose of it and. I, I've never really seen like a life drawing done in this way, in this geometric style. Um, yeah, it was just really interesting. It's really a really um, striking image, I think. And, you know, with the background colors as well. And it's interesting, the colors you've chosen, the pinks and the bits of yellow as well. Yeah, it's an odd one. It's it's one of the first artworks I did really in this style, and that's partially why it's quite simplistic in nature. It's before I got really detailed with them, and it's kind of gives it a bit of a special vibe in its own right. Um, the the work itself, um, famously called uh, "Man Sitting on Toilet" by a few people over the years. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a pandemic created work. And yeah, it's as you might have noticed, it is myself actually who was the model for this work. Um and I used the backdrop for it. I had an incredibly large five foot six by five foot six canvas left over from a project in 20, 2015, 2016. Um 
that had a rather awful painting on it of some church interiors and I partially covered that up with white acrylic paint and then did a kind of geometric panel over it so mm -hmm. when I was creating the kind of inspiration for this image uh, I kind of had a physical backdrop so it's quite unusual as the works go that there was a physical geometric backdrop for this so all of the shapes were painted on another canvas so it's a painting within a painting that's interesting so it's like there's many layers to it then i mean this is a local interest one so i'll, I'll let again i'll let scott ask the questions regarding this yeah no this one's interesting because again it's quite similar to this one in terms of style more sort of just shapes, not as much detail as your more recent work. I'm not sure when this one was created, actually. Oh, good question. Uh, when, either 20, perhaps 21, 22, certainly, certainly at least get, getting on for a year, two years ago. It's an older work of of that kind of little South Wales series, that I think there's four in that series, um, but that's uh, my favourite of them. The customer's favourite tends to be Penna Van. Uh, yeah. I love it. I've always loved the four works because I just think it's something that's quite special that uh, none of the other works do. Yeah. Uh, but for those who aren't local based off black and white photograph of the Port Albert Steelworks, some of the industry within uh, the sort of Neath Port Albert area, which of course is an incredibly important part of the town, town's biggest employer for many years, I understand. Um, yeah. Some I have a bit of a personal connection to, having had a variety of relatives historically who worked for the Steelworks. Uh, and I think it's quite important for the people of Port Albert. I'm... I've, and Neef, uh, of course. Yes, it's um, it's a big employer. It was recently in the news. Every couple of years, it seems to crop up with rumours of it maybe closing, um, which would be, well, a big thing for Port Albert if that did close. For anyone who hears me and Scott speaking about the little works, this is what we're talking about. The little six by six inch prints. Uh, the been lovely uh, bagged and mounted by um, my contractor and a future brother-in-law oh. uh, up in Merseyside who's put these together for us um, and yeah so basically you've got uh, those ones there currently there are some of the works that aren't in those sizes can be done or pre-ordered uh, via Scott to those sizes um and yeah we're hope hopefully we'll be able to keep some in stock with neef after the exhibition um uh but yeah there we go um but yeah they, they, that's a sort of slight tangent but yeah they, they'll hopefully certainly be some in stock there if not uh if you see any works in this video that you'd like and You'd have to live like me to Neef if you pop in and speak to Scott or Bethan, and I'm sure they can pass across an order, and we'll let you know when the next order date for stuff like that would be. Um, th these are just more works from the Hay on Y show. Uh, you've got Hay Castle there, uh, the tower at St Leonard's Church in Yarpool, which I think is in Herefordshire. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, we've got the we've got the Paddington here. We're not doing many more Paddingtons at the moment. Um, so, uh, so we're I tend to refer to them as bear. We were I was looking into finding ways to ensure we had the correct permissions to use the work, but we haven't been able to source that. So we're looking to phase out the work. So if you want a Paddington, come and get a Paddington uh, before we phase them out. But yeah, we're moving more towards doing the sort of more wild animals. Um, 
So we're kind of coming back really to start here. Oh, I should say here, though, there are two works in this room which aren't part of the set, uh, which are of local interest. One, so this isn't actually local. This is Colebrook Dale, which is over in Shropshire. Um, it's based off a very famous painting that's in the Science Museum collection in London uh, of the furnaces in Colebrook Dale. I've sent it to um, Neef because I felt it was kind of very much was whilst it's not the local kind of industry, it's very much of that tradition of industry that the town's very proud of. Of course, anyone local will know where this is. This is the Undercroft at Neef Abbey. I was telling Scott before we started recording that uh, I've been watching a lot of the old Doctor Who's recently. If anyone's not watched the the early new Doc Twos, like the ones since BBC Wales took it over with Russell T Davis. Um, it's quite fun spotting what location in Wales that is. And there's mm -hmm. quite a lot of times uh, this Abbey, Neef Abbey Undercroft reappears. Um, but yeah, there we go. So that the, this kind of leads us back to the start uh, with the Atlas de Zoology. The Daffodil is a fun example because it's the second version of the Daffodil artwork. The original one, I spent hours trying to get right and then I gave up on it and then I tried with a totally different image of a totally different Daffodil and I got it sorted in about half an hour. So huh. just one of those weird ones that sort of hours of frustration trying to get one right and then the other one I get very quickly um because yeah the, the different works take different lengths of time some of them took days some of them took hours some of them are quite quick um, yeah it's interesting I find the same with my own work sometimes it can just depend on the certain mood I'm in or how creative I'm feeling I can either work quickly or it'll take me ages there doesn't seem to be a set amount of time, really. Yeah, I mean, the Gallup work there was one of the most time-consuming works I've produced in an awful long time. It's got quite a high level of detail. Probably paid itself back because we've sold quite a lot of Gallup's over the years. Um, it's always a story in Wales that you hear from a primary school age, really. I mean, to be honest, I didn't really hear it until I moved back to Wales as an adult. It was a bit of a new one to me. Really, I came across when I was researching a solo show for Harlech. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there we go. Um, Kevin continues to travel Australia. There's all sorts of exhibitions he's doing out here. Uh, so anyone in Australia watching... Uh, Brisbane, he's on show at the moment, um, and hopefully it'll be an event out in Ipswich, Queensland in December. Um, I don't know if there's any other works to pick up. Of course, Parrots in San Paolo. Uh, yeah, so th there's, there's lots going on. Um, the the snake is a fun one here, uh, if I, I'm permitted a... The snake um, is based off a archival image from Aberystwyth University collection, actually a cutout of, uh, from a Victorian periodical, and it dates from the early 19th century. The original image is a black and white uh, etching based off presumably a drawing, and it's a very human-like crocodile waving to a snake that's hanging from a tree, a sort of boa constrictor type snake. So it's just, it's quite a quaint image, the original one, because it feels very much like it was drawn by someone who'd never seen a snake or a crocodile in the wild. Not mm -hmm. I ever have either, I have to confess, but I think these days, through the advent of TV and cameras, we kind of know a lot more what stuff looks like. Yeah. But it just has that kind of early charm uh, of the sort of 19th century about it. I think we've covered everything, just... Thank you for joining us, really. I know it's late in Australia, so I hope we haven't kept you up too late. Not too late. Uh, not as late as before. Um, but yeah, no, and, hopefully people enjoy it. As I said, there's... And, yeah. And, and if you are in Meath or local or fairly close to me, please come in and see Chris at the Meath exhibition here. We've got oh, another 
week. Well, it ends this Saturday, doesn't it? Yeah, so a few few days left. Yeah, yeah, so come and see all these animals from the snail that's in my sister's garden in Cardiff to uh, so all sorts of exotic Australian and far-off animals. Um, uh, and yeah, if you want, uh, if anyone wants more information about the animals uh, and works, there should be a couple of copies of the catalogue of the series with Scott um, and we can always send them a PDF as well. Yeah, we have the catalogue on our um, front desk as you walk in. Oh, that's good. Yeah, other than that, um, hopefully yeah. I'll find someone as accommodating as Scott up at uh, Six Foot Gallery in Glasgow and you'll be able to see what we do for them in 2024. And hopefully we we'll might do some uh, mini pop-ups or other solos in the screen time. Um, it's certainly been a journey.